what is an arborist? How do you define safety on your crew? What is your strategy for selling tree work? Are trees sentient beings? And why wigs and aerial rescue do not mix? Through a mix of deep dives on individual subjects, getting out and field testing our equipment, and interviews with the people that make up our industry, Tree Thinking will answer these questions and many more as we try to understand the tree world around us on the Tree Thinking Podcast. On this episode, we get into the relationship between wildlife in the woods and the urban forest. And it was great to have Sarah on. She brought a different perspective and a whole lot of knowledge. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on. And with that, we're going to take care of some business and then get right into it. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not, nor is it intended to be, a substitute for professional arboriculture advice and should never be relied upon to perform or direct arboricultural work. The Tree Thinking Podcast makes no representations as to the accuracy, completeness, or suitability of any information on this podcast and will not be liable for any damages arising from the use of any information in the practice of arboriculture or tree work. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the guests and their appearance on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. The podcast and its host are not to be held responsible for misuse, cited, and or unsighted copies of the content within this podcast by others. The Tree Thinking Podcast may not be reproduced or distributed without the express written consent of the Tree Thinking Podcast. When working in a tree, what needs to be done? Deadwood, building clearance, hazard mitigation, maybe even some ornamental pruning. This is usually what the client is looking for, but what we want is a small piece of the puzzle. Trees are home to more life than you can imagine. From animals like birds and squirrels, to bugs and even microorganisms. Did you know there's a salamander that lives its whole life in the canopy of an old growth tree? As people who work where the forest meets the city, how can we help facilitate this transition in a way where we all benefit? On this episode of Tree Thinking, we create a habitat where our business helps the forest because the forest helps our business on wildlife and trees. All right. Well, this week we're going to look at wildlife and trees. I love wildlife in uh, doing habitat stems when you're removing a tree and the client, instead of having you haul all that extra heavy wood out, they decide to have you create this cool wildlife stem. It's one of my favorite things and I'll take pictures and put it on Instagram. But the one question I always get is what's that for? Why do you do that? So hopefully we'll kind of talk about that a little bit and get to the bottom of it. Uh, before we get too deep, uh, my name's Andrew Myron I'm at NW Tree Guy on Instagram. Uh, my name's Rob Myron. You can reach me at SperryTreeCare.com. My name is Corey Shields. You can find me on Instagram at Shieldco21. I'm Becca Snowdale at Rainbow underscore Volcano. Uh, Sarah Ward. You can find me on Instagram at Mittens underscore PNW. Sweet. Well, uh, I'm I'm pretty stoked because we got. Uh, people from all different parts of tree work uh, here today. And so we're going to get some pretty cool perspectives. You know, it's not just about creating habitat snags. Uh, It's also about kind of the interface, how the trees in the forest and the trees in the town and how, what we can learn from the trees in the forest and bring that to our work in the town to help create a healthier urban forest. If the urban forest is healthy, then everybody's jobs are doing better because their trees are healthier. I guess we should start off by getting into uh, some stories from the field. What do you guys think? Sounds good. Right on. Excellent. Who's got a story? Yeah, I've got one. It's uh, tangentially related to habitat trees. It's actually one of those ones where you wouldn't want to put a habitat tree in. Um, So Andrew and I, earlier this week, we worked on a a pretty gnarly dead fir, probably 100 and, what do you say, 110 feet maybe? 
at least. I I was going to say 125, 130. It, was, it wasn't a big tree, but it was a tall tree, and it was skinny, and it was crispy dead. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very crispy dead. We had been out there before, um, and there was some question as to whether or not it was a city tree, so, you know, whether we were going to punt it off onto another crew and have them have to deal with it, but it turned out it was our tree, so guess what? We had to deal with it. <laughs> um, it was, it was a, yeah, it was, it was, uh, one of those ones where I was not, uh, I was not stoked to be in the tree at the time, but you know, afterwards it was after having done it, it's like, okay, great. I'm <laughs> glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. But yeah, it was a really crispy tree, but the, the property owner actually wanted us to turn it into a habitat, but it was in the South Hills of Eugene. It was on the steep slope right above some primaries and right above Lorraine Highway. So leaving a habitat there wouldn't have been great, A, because it was back behind their fence. They built their fence around city property, so it looked like it was private property, but it wasn't. And if we would have had to leave a habitat there, then we would have had to come back and remove it at, uh, at a later date, or it could have fallen into the highway, and that was just, yeah, not a great not a great thing to do. But, yeah, so we wound up removing it. It was uh, a long day, but, yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, it was it was one of those ones where you're tied into two different trees, one on either side of you, so you're kind of hanging in between. And I could see you going up and cutting on it, and it just, at a certain point, you just stopped using the chainsaw because the whole tree moved so much. Every, it was minimized. That don't even want to pull start a chainsaw. You're just kind of <laughs> grabbing and tossing as get it down as quick as you can. <laughs> yep, that was, wow. Yeah, it was fun. Nice <laughs> was, work. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. But, yeah, no, it's... Uh, mm. I guess that kind of segues into the right time and a place for habitat tree. Actually, the week before that, I mean, we had talked about it on a previous episode of the podcast. I had done a bid on removing a habitat tree because it was time for it to come down. And literally the next day it came down across the fence and I've got a picture of it smashing this fence. And it was the best case scenario because it could have smashed a house or a car or something else. And it was right next to a pretty busy street, but it just smashed this fence. So, you know, no harm, no foul mostly okay they've got the fence all fixed up and everything but you know selecting this the site for your habitat tree is every bit as important as actually making a good habitat tree because if the thing comes down and smashes it that's going to sour people's opinion on a habitat tree and they're just Mm -hmm. not going to want them anymore because like why would you leave a habitat tree it's going to smash my fence or it's going to smash my car so yeah yeah anybody else have any good stories of uh, habitat trees um i do have one it was it was about a month ago but it was this old black oak that needed to come out with two stems. And the the homeowner had built, I thought it was a tree house driving up because there's this big fence and it's kind of on a hill. But it turns out it's not quite a tree house. It's just like nestled in between these oaks and some firs on the ground. But um, it was a funny job because they had astroturf in the backyard. Oh, no. <laughs> so we had to rig every single little piece out. And, oh. oh, God, and she's like, don't <laughs> damage the astroturf. We're like, okay. <laughs> it was fun rigging. We had, like, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting setup. Very stressful job for the climber, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, thankfully, I was on the ground because of the whole time I was just like, mm. But, yeah, it was great. Originally, she wanted it taken all the way down, but, you know, it, it gets to the point, and this is the second time I've done a removal very close to a structure or a tree house where we ended up just kind of like selling them on the habitat <laughs> snack because we're like, oh, God, this is a lot of material. And like, you know, thankfully, both of the trunks were leaning away from the structure. So it was an easy sell. And we're like, you know, it's like eh, maybe like 20 feet off the ground. And if it if it ever did like decay and fall, it would just be in, you know, of no consequence whatsoever. So that was fun. But it, it's just, yeah, that was a good one because I think that was a good sell. And it looks great now. You can see it. Like, as you're driving, it's on, it's right uh, by your house. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. it's yeah. Uh, that 28th and Chambers. Oh, like yeah. the brand yeah. new tree house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. yeah. Yeah. I know, I know which one you're talking exactly. about. Exactly, yeah. Cool. And it was awesome. a really fun job. And, um, and, and, yeah, they ended up being really excited about it. And it's, nice. Yeah, so... Nice. That, that's my uh, <laughs> wildlife-related story from the field as uh, watching that happen and seeing how, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, when it's appropriate, it's really easy to sell people on that because it, it just makes more sense than having, you know, having to cut the trunk so close to that structure would have been, would have been way more technical than, you know, need be. And 
It's actually pretty similar to the last wildlife poll that I that I uh, made. It it was a black oak, severe lean over a house, probably thirty inches in diameter. So it was really technical getting the tree out. And I actually showed up kind of like two thirds of the way through the day, and nobody thought I was going to get done. And it's like, no, this tree's coming down. We're getting it done. Yeah. And it was it was just a pretty kind of intense project that was really technical. Then at the end, I, I carved a wildlife snag, which I actually got the inspiration for the technique from Andrew, where you leave kind of a shelf on one side and then come down on the other side. It looks like a chair nice. kind of that you could sit yeah. in I, and uh, then soften it all off. Yeah. On, on Instagram, I actually made a little kind of like a how-to video on how I do those. Oh, nice. And put it on there. So, cool. yeah, if you're interested in seeing what he's talking about, just – you know, follow down on the Instagram far enough, and there's a little a little tutorial. Nice, nice. So I I put that shelf in it and softened it off and put some character in it, and then put a lightning strike going down. Everybody likes the lightning strike. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a good <laughs> one. That, that's the money one. That's yeah. the money one. <laughs> and when I got down, I talked to the client, and the client watched us do the whole thing and just wanted to talk about the wildlife snag. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, you just watched me do like this crazy thing. And all you want to do is talk about the wildlife <laughs> snake. Yeah. Like, this is pretty week. cool. Yeah. It's like she loved it. You know, it, yeah. it was, it was a, a great way to end the job with the client being super stoked mm-hmm. and impressed and just happy with something that they'll be able to enjoy for years to come. Yeah. yeah. That reminds me because we just did that. Well, it was a few months ago. We did that big fur removal and I did that big wildlife snag just around the corner from my house. So I was walking the kids over to a friend's house and I'm on the way back and I, you can see it from the backyard. It's just this giant fur with this, you know, snag towering over these trees and I'm looking at it and this other couple comes walking up to me and looks over at me and they're like, where do you think that tree landed? There's nothing damaged around it. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it turns out I actually did that. (laughs) Just explaining what was going on. They're like, what? (laughs) (laughs) That's how you know you did a good job if it looks natural. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. no, I I was like, that is the biggest compliment I could get. Thank you. you That's the thing, too, about this job I was just talking about is we were like, before we made the snag, we're like, how would it, trying to make it look natural, right? So like, oh, well, maybe like a, it was just funny seeing my buddy, my two friends, like just going over how, how to, uh, how to make it seem like a tree had just like swung through. They're like, oh, well, (laughs) you know, it's not outside of the realm of reason that this would, you know, but just staggering it in such a way that it looks natural, which I think is interesting because, you know, forever ago I asked when I first saw people doing coronets, I'm like, what's the point? Like, do birds prefer that? Or does, is there certain things that will, like, would rather habitat a coroneted spar rather than the, if mm. you just leave it? And it was actually Scott Altenhoff. And oh, he's nice. like, uh, no, it's just like, if we don't do this, it looks like an unfinished job. <laughs> 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 but it's funny to see people take it to an artistic level, which I hope we get to talk more about. Well, and we also, we do that with the Forest Service. We make king's crowns oh, cool. in the woods. On nice. It. So I think. The argument is that it's easier for birds to build a nest on the snag when okay. it's ripped out like that because it's not a flat, smooth surface. So, so there, there is it does happen in the woods. It. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not just for. I, I've yeah. also heard that it's good for decay because it allows like water to kind of pool in there, yeah. and then it'll decay away and allow the boring insects and boring birds heart uh, rot, heart rot, yep. and all that. See, to, this all to makes sense. To me. Yeah. That, that's kind of what I assume that these bugs will like make little homes, and because I've seen birds at the top of them before, just pecking into it. And I figure there's little spiders and stuff that are just tucking themselves in, and birds are like, sweet, food. Nice. Yeah, yeah actually, that makes a lot more sense than the <laughs> just making it look cool. Well, it does look cool, too, though. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> why, you know, two birds with one stone. <laughs> you know, it looks cool, and it's functional. Yeah, most exactly. of this job is looking cool, so. <laughs> checks that box. Definitely checks that box. Not when I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. All right. Well, uh, anybody else have any stories? Um, I've got a question for you guys. Um, I went to a workshop that Brian French was putting on about wildlife and trees and how to how to make you know different nests and techniques and whatnot. And he was he was showing us a technique in making a like a birdhouse where you plunge in 
on all four kind of sides to make a box or a rectangle. Yep. And then plunge in from the side and pull it out and cut out the middle. Yep. Drill a hole in. Huh. Have you guys done any of that? Yeah. I have. So no, you have. When you cut it, you have to cut at angles. That way yeah. you slide the face out and then you can slide it back in. Yeah. And that way it stays in there. And then what, the other thing I'll do is I'll take little chunks of wood and I'll shove them into the curve. Nice. And kind of hammer them in. That way the pressure of the wood kind of holds it all together. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 If you have a like a screwdriver too, you can take it up there and, and screw into like each, each end of it. Yeah. And that'll keep it. To hold the face se- on. Hold the whole face on yep. a little yeah. bit more secure than just yeah. like wood chunks. I, I made one of those two or three years ago and i actually had birds move into it nice. pretty much within three months unfortunately the starlings came in and then they killed the the birds and then they nested in there so oh it was one of those things so i i think i i might have made the hole too big to allow the starlings in so that's kind of one of my i want to revisit that and i want to remake it again you know in, in a in a separate tree and try to figure out a better way to to keep that in keep those other bird the predators out of that that kind of situation. Yeah. And I don't, I it's, don't fully understand what I did wrong or what I could have done. Better. Well, that's the thing about wildlife is it's yeah. wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can only control the situation so much. Yeah. You know? and, and starlings are invasive. So maybe it was just, that was it, just the way it was going to go. Yeah. Obviously if they moved in in the first place, right. it was right. It just, you know, there's wrong a whole species. nother issue yeah. going on. <laughs> right. That really does bring it to a whole nother level of, what side of the tree you're putting the nest on, yeah. you know, how big the entrance hole is, how big the actual nest uh, nesting space is. You can get really involved in, in, you know, depending on the habitat that you're in, really focusing to try and build a nest for a specific kind of bird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One, one yeah. thing I've thought about doing is not just birds, but on a big enough tree, I'd love to carve out a big enough cavity for bees. Yeah, mm. you know, yeah. so a bee c- net hive could move in there, and then you could do the same thing. You just put the hole at the base, like on a nice. beehive, and then bees could come and go and inhabit. And just, it, you know, it, I think it'd be a great way. People talking about how bees are on the decline. Well, if if you got uh, a natural beehive going on out there, you know, you're getting swarms moving in, and then they're spitting swarms out. Yeah, I, I mean, that seems like a pretty good scenario to me. Yeah, well, like a giant union and a. Uh, cottonwood or even a Oregon uh, maple, a yeah. big leaf maple. A big leaf yeah. maple. Yeah. They love big leaf. There's that leaves. one on West 11th. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. yeah. That's a cool tree. one. Yeah. Years. That, that, Every year. Yeah. yeah. Now, the, I think yeah. the hive may have died and had other ones move in because there's points where it's not as active. Mm-hmm. And we actually pruned that tree. Nice. And I could see that the, uh, the hive that was in there had mites pretty bad. Oh. There, there was a couple bees crawling around without wings and, you know, but that's the natural, you know, these days at least, that's how the natural cycle of bees is becoming. Yeah. The uh, bees can only survive a couple of years in a hive. They get killed by mites. Hopefully they spit out enough swarms in those couple of years to repopulate other ones. I mean, yeah. you know. Well, and, you know, bees aren't native either. Yeah. No. Bees aren't native. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I was going to say, that's it's your starling. Yeah. 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 Your but they make honey. Yeah. <laughs> and they do things for us, like help us make food. Yeah, they make yeah. us food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, we're invasive too. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, you know, you zoom out far enough, you know, we're all part of nature. Yeah. You know, yeah. did this start, did we move the starlings here? Did the starlings use us to expand their territory? I mean, you know, at what point is it natural and not if we're... I'm not part gonna, of nature. I'm not going to give the starlings that kind of credit. I hate those birds. Oh, <laughs> I hate I those like birds. And yet you made yeah. such a nice home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't intentional. Obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't you seen Planet Earth where they all fly in unison? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Were you not inspired? Yeah. That's propaganda. That's propaganda. <laughs> right on. Well, I think right now is a good time to uh, call Dan up. Nice. See, see sure. what Dan has to say uh, on the subject. Anytime's a good time to call Dan. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Dan uh, segment of the show. The Dan. Yeah. Hour. <laughs> About Dan time. Nice. Here we go. Hello, hello. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Good. How are you? Ah, doing pretty good. We're just uh, all here hanging out talking about wildlife trees. Great. We were just kind of telling some stories. We're getting into some techniques, uh, making different wildlife snags and whatnot. What What are your thoughts on uh, wildlife snags? Well, I um, if I think that, you know, they might be interested in it, I'll, I'll give them the option, you know, a wildlife snag. 
I I was doing more, I think, but then I kind of figured out how long it takes to really do them right. Yeah. And so I don't think I've been doing as many. I think I've gotten lazy and I was, I've just been more just leaving a, a flat top. Now, when you guys talk about wildlife snags, you guys are talking about, you know, doing them all up and putting holes in them and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's a couple different levels. You know, you can just kind of uh, rough up the top, basically, you know, make, try to make it look like an old broken top. And then we were getting into uh-huh. also kind of boring into the side and, you know, putting a bird box or uh, something into uh-huh. the side. And, I mean, it, it really all depends on how much time you want to put into it. But that's an angle we hadn't really looked at is uh, at what point – is it more beneficial? Cause there is, you know, if you're hauling the wood, that might be 30 feet of trunk. You don't have to haul. Uh, yeah. But you can do that pretty quick. You know? Yeah. So I don't know. That's, that's a good yeah, point. It's a, it's a, yeah. At first you think, uh, much less work to just do a wildlife snag. But then I was finding when I start getting into it and, but I think if I get, you know, you get better at it. Like, for one thing, what I do is I make sure I, if I'm doing big wood, I bring up a big saw to do it. Mm-hmm. I used to use a small saw thinking that was the way to do it. But if you're if you're in a, a Doug fir trunk, it's, sometimes it's best to just have a big saw. You can cut out big chunks. Yeah. A lot of times it's those, that. Uh-huh. those big ripping cuts that you definitely want a big saw for. Yeah. That's the way I've been doing it lately. It's, uh do a great big chunk out. So I get a one long spear going up and then a few smaller ones and kind of try to get creative with it. I, I mean, it's fun. I did one today. You saw the picture of that one today. It's the first time I did one with a hole through the spear. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. I've never thought about doing it. I, I'm going to have to uh, steal that idea from you next time I'm doing one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it came out pretty good. And uh, I like to leave uh, stubs, especially if it's deadwood stubs, you know, leave the stubs. And then I like to cut a little hole, like, right above the stubs so it kind of looks like a birdhouse. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. Wow, we had a pretty cool yeah. idea kicking around to try and get a, a bee nest to move into a tree and, and create some kind of like a cavity for a bee's nest. Huh. I, I, I wonder how that is. Yeah, you'd have to talk to a bee guy on that and yeah. what they would want. I would imagine yeah. it's species dependent. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, big leaf maple or tilia probably would do really sure. well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you. I think you want yeah. about two to five gallon uh, cavity would be my guess for bees, mm. and then you'd want the hole at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, so that's serious. Yeah, and you'd want it to be facing south. So it's definitely one when you're talking about how much time it uh-huh. would take. That'd be a, a commitment, you know. <laughs> would there be a way to like yeah, attract the bees commitment. to it? You'd have to sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and sure. that that's a good question, Rob. You'd have to get. You can get like Swarm Commander, which is a little spray. Or lemongrass, or yeah, lemongrass oil. There's some different things that uh, a lot of beekeepers use to try to bring bees in. So I'd imagine um, you'd want to do that, and so that's another aspect. You you know, unless you're planning on going back to it, you'd want to do that on on the time of year. You'd want to do the uh, cavity the time of year that you're trying to attract this snag, so you could bait it while you're there. I did some wildlife snags for a. Uh, professor at the University of Washington and he was a bird guy and so he had uh, like five acres and so he hired me to just go in and make snacks and so I made a bunch of different snacks and one of the ones that really worked out good was um, like I would go say 40 feet I, I would top it at about 60 feet but then go down and then kind of strip it and I leave the bottom 40 feet of branches all green and then right at there I girdle it you know and I do my wildlife snag above that so the tree stayed alive but it had this this wildlife like top to it kind of like a live snag kind of situation yeah 
Yeah. So then the, so then he didn't have to worry about the tree getting rotten and falling over. The tree was still alive, but it had this wildlife snag at the top. And those worked out good and they looked cool. Yeah. yeah that's really neat. Uh, well, and Jamie was doing, yeah, uh, was working on say. some of those where they were girdling the tree. And I, weren't they even leaving the, the uh, it, top girdled? It mm-hmm. was like a 20 feet or so of the top girdled and the bottom's 40 to 60 feet live. Yeah. He's been, yeah. He's been yeah, exactly. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Oh, we do that with the forest service as well. We do the high girdled and the leave them live so they uh-huh. can grow and still get some rotten cavities. That's the balance of working in the woods compared to working in town. Yeah. You know, it's going to be hard yeah. to convince someone to, yeah, we're just going to girdle it and leave those 40 feet up there. Yep. It'll be great cavity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might smash your deck, but it'll be great cavity. Just don't park your car there for the next 10 years. <laughs> Maybe fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys know? Do you guys know Jason Lovejoy? Uh, I don't think that no. the name doesn't no. ring a bell. No, no. I've I've uh, he, he's uh, he used to work for Vern, right, at Buena Vista. Yeah, he yeah. used to. Uh, he's good friends with Vern, but I, I believe that's all he's doing now is working for a forest service making snags. Oh, nice! Just, yeah. That's all he's doing is uh, snagging snagging trees so, you know they got to have two certain amount of snags and a uh, certain amount of area and so where's he working out of now he, he's well he's down in uh corvallis area there but i'm not sure where exactly he's working i think he travels different forests. gotcha yeah he's probably but, contracting um, probably yeah we don't have any uh, yeah full-time staff something like that, that yeah of. And yeah. he does different types. I mean, he was, I forget the different types, but there's a different amount of money for different types. I guess he calls the basic a crown. Just a crown top is the basic one. And and then more expensive, you know, is blowing the top out and stuff like that. So you get all the splinters up there. How about the bird nest? Do you guys do that? Uh, like carving the bird box into the side or creating another bird nest? Yeah, like, uh, well, you cut, first you cut, like, the a, a, a slice off. Yep. And and then you drill a hole through that, and you have to drill a certain size hole for a certain size bird. And you kind of put that in your pouch, and then you carve the hole out as best you can. And then you take that slice you took off, and you put it back on and screw it, screw it back on. Yeah, we were, we were just talking about that. I actually uh, I made one for my parents in their front yard, and um, oh. we had some birds move in, and I think I screwed up the size of the hole because some starlings moved in right after the birds moved in. I don't know what I didn't uh, see the birds move in, but my parents said there's some birds that moved in. They were you know inhabiting it, and then the starlings came in and kicked out the the young of the other birds and started raising their own in there. So I think I screwed it up uh. somehow, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure how I how I messed it up. Maybe maybe I made the hole yeah, too big or something. Yeah, yeah, the size hole. Yeah, the size hole. Yeah. That that's a great way to do it. And the the other thing that uh, we'll do sometimes is we'll carve bat flaps into the side of them. Oh, nice. You know, just some the bat, bat flat, like the like the just the slice going up the a uh, bark. Yeah, yeah. it kind of looks like fish gills. Exactly, just up at an angle, and then you, uh-huh. just like really mini. You know, cut so that just enough for a bat to kind of wiggle its way up in there, and so yeah, yeah. You know, I but, throw those in too. I never know if they work or not, but kind of throw those in. They sure look cool, though. Yeah, it looks yeah. cool, and if nothing else, it's something you can sell the wildlife snag with. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, you know, I mean, if it works, it works. It's great. Yeah. Well, I wonder yeah. how long people have been carving wildlife snags. Tim Brown is, yeah. he's been, so he did his, he did a, a course at the last uh, conference in Eugene. It was a couple years uh-huh. ago. He's, he's been, he's been, uh, he talked about doing it. So he started off, we're, we're going to have him as a guest uh, one of these times on the show, but he started off not to steal too much of his son there, but he started off um, being a logger and he, he said himself, he's kind of a shitty logger because he would. <laughs> try to maintain as much habitat as he possibly could. He, he has a lot of stories from the early 90s, so he's been doing it for 
three, four decades now. Yeah, and some of those pictures were from before the nineties. Yeah, you yeah. know he he and he he does uh, logs on the ground, so he'll cut. You know he'll get real specific with the the creatures that are living in the woods near him, and he'll he'll try to make the habitat work for for the critters that are around him. Yeah, right on. Do you have anything else you want to add about uh, wildlife snags? Um, not that I can think of right now. I know Brian French does a lot of them. Yeah, He's, I've seen him do a talk. Yeah, I was gonna. Uh, yeah. We were we were talking about uh, reaching out to Brian at some point because uh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's got some good skills when it comes to those snags. Yeah, he he loves even deadwood. He tries to talk people out of even he's taking the deadwood out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> he's into it. He likes it. You know, I I'm, I'm it's hard for me because I love a clean tree. I'm just so programmed to have it tree just all blinged out so i see deadwood and you know but he loves it even his tree at his house is full of deadwood i'm like god i would clean that out <laughs> <laughs> sounds like our yard it's yeah. a different mindset <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah in terms of habitat though i mean deadwood is good wood yeah right? yeah <laughs> it, yeah it's we've interesting a, we've got a red-shouldered hawk Right now, nice. nesting up in our trees. Wow. Oh, nice. that, wow. talk about habitat. Yeah, yeah, it's great. They didn't used to live in Eugene. They've been migrating north. Um, so it used to be like a California wintering bird. Now they're more and more you're finding them in Eugene. Nice. Yeah, we had uh, we had a couple, you know, medium-sized dug firs, 100 feet plus, uh, probably 25 inches or so. And... Uh, there was either a flicker or a flicker, yeah. okay. There was a flicker nesting up there, and I let it, I left it up there as long as I could, uh, but eventually, you know, it's over the house and it's dead. It's been dead for a long time, and it it just had to come down. Yeah, we'd run home every windstorm. Oh, <laughs> like, I wonder if it fell. I wonder if it fell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, no, bad. It had to come down. I have a dead tree in my yard too that I'm like, well, I could just like take it out, but I see the birds and the squirrels enjoying it. And I'm same same story, yeah. but I I do whenever there's a heavy wind or like a, <laughs> a snow event, I'm like, did, did it happen? Did it finally split in half? No, it's so dead Somebody I don't even know what tree it is. Like it's, <laughs> it's like, yeah. not even identifiable. Well, uh, I'm gonna let you get right back to, back to your poker game, okay. Dan. Thanks for uh, right. thanks for coming on the show. Okay, all right. Talk to you next week. All right, sounds good. Okay. Bye. Right on is it's always great having Dan on. Yeah, I thought of another good one, a good pun, and uh, <laughs> for Dan. And, and you didn't let it out for Dan. You didn't and, share it with Dan. <laughs> it's uh the hour Kraus. Get it? I get it. No, you get it? Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Seen a lot of blank stares. <laughs> <laughs> At least I have one. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. It's just bad. Oh. <laughs> I don't like it. I mean, you're not wrong, but yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> don't hurt my feelings like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different angles to this, but let's take a quick look at what benefits a business owner. You know, why, why would you, the kind of the question that we started the podcast off, why would you do it? Why would you, if you're running a business, you know, like Dan said, it takes time, you know, it might be quicker just to chunk these chunks down and get them out of here. Why do you guys think wildlife in a tree, how, how does that benefit a small business? Well, it saves your back quite a bit. I mean, chunking out giant pieces of wood, unless you've got a, you know, a, a skid steer or something to help you yard it out of there. I'd much rather come back and haul out some dead chunks of wood than freshly dead fur, like fur that I had just killed uh, out of a backyard on a steep slope in the rain. But that's yeah. just me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure when we first started doing wildlife trees, we we weren't thinking as much about wildlife as the lack of wood we would have to haul out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but things so, things evolved into into understanding it more, and um, and now I I get really excited about the prospect of having birds move in and yeah. and getting wildlife moving in. So it, it really has kind of changed into doing it more for the love of, of the, the, the critters 
But initially, I, I don't think that was as, as much of a thought. It was more just like, hey, will you go talk to the client and see if we can leave a 30-foot pole? <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're, we're running out of daylight here. we got to get this job done. Just over it. Tell them it's wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing, too, Do is it like... for the birds. Yeah, like, <laughs> birds are awesome and special, and, like, we all... Everybody loves birds, and it's easy to sink your teeth into that. You know, birds won't come unless there are bugs. Mm-hmm. And... Like, I, I'm sure we're all well read by now on, like, the insect apocalypse, they're calling it. You know, we've got, like, a a bug. Doesn't seem that way because there's, they're small and they're, you know, they breed in mass. But um, it's, it's great to have bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think having habitat for them, which in turn will bring the birds, which in turn, you know, the circle of life and all that, but. One of those cornerstones of ecosystems kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it kind of is, yeah. W- yeah. Wiping all of it out, the whole thing kind of falls exactly. like a deck of cards. The next dominant species. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think we look at, as arborists, we're so trained to look at trees as an individ- individual specimen. Yeah. You know, when, where in fact it's part of a larger organism, which is a forest. You know, and maybe Sarah could probably talk about this way more than we can. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Not so much individual. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like, these trees need other things to survive, you know. For sure, yeah. And yeah. and we need the trees to have tree businesses, so. <laughs> Little plug for Sarah, YouTube, without this place, at uh, H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, and there's a badass video with Sarah in it. Happen. <laughs> well, and and let's take a minute, Sarah. Uh, what do you do? I guess we we know you, so we understand your expertise here. But I guess most people listening don't understand why you are so much more knowledgeable than we are about this. <laughs> well, so I'm a, a wildlife biologist for the Forest Service as of late, um, but I've worked a bunch of different jobs doing different forest ecology <laughs> research, and that's all I do is spend my time in the woods. I don't really do this urban thing that yeah. y'all spend your time yeah. <laughs> it's cool but yeah so these days you know I go out and I map old growth and I do red tree vole surveys and I'm gonna do some climbing but most of the time I'm on the ground you know hiking around in the woods looking for rare plants and rare wildlife and trying to sort of best merge timber harvest and the mission of the forest service with you know timber and wildlife and protecting what we can and conserving what we've got left so yeah that that's similar to what a lot of arborists do that um, are progressive and kind of looking out for wildlife and trees and so that there is a bridge there oh for sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not like a separate world they're just different yeah we're cousins yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and i think that's what this whole subject is kind of talks about is that bridge of you know, where the forest meets the city and in the city, if it, if you just have your Japanese maple and, you know, your one other tree, you're, you're probably not creating as much habitat for, you know, the bugs and the birds and whatnot as if you leave that old ash in your backyard and don't remove it just because it looks a little old and messy, which is uh, what we need, you know. Uh, one interesting thing that I've, kind of learned from some of Sarah's work in relationship to wildlife in the woods with her phenology work is just the the birds and the timing that they come back to the forest is kind of mixed up and maybe you want to hit on that a little bit yeah so phenology is the timing of when things happen basically in a very broad sense so what I looked at and I think what Rob's talking about is um the timing of spring green up with plants uh, and how everything is evolved in sync with one another. So when plants green up, that's when the insects come out because then you've got your big food source and cover and then the birds tend to show up from wherever they migrate from at the same time. I mean, in theory, but these days we've got these crazy winters with no snowpack that are super warm or the opposite where it's way cold later in the season when it ought not to be. Um, so you're getting this, it's called a trophic asynchrony where, uh, the birds will show up, but either the, the plants all leafed out and the bugs all came out way earlier. And so then you've got nesting birds that suddenly have a much diminished food source, um, and habitat 
over the the course of the season. So, if, but it doesn't always happen, and it's it's localized to microclimates. It's not across the board. It's definitely a variable across the mountains. But are you seeing it more frequently now with uh, changes in the climate? Or yeah. yeah, yeah, we're definitely seeing like so. That's what I did my master's research on, and we saw um, those high elevation sites that are outside the inversion where, you know, you go hiking in the Cascades and it feels like it's 70 degrees in December because the sun's out. Those sites are getting nuked. You know, the we had plants that were, I had a, a vine maple cluster that was leafing out like three months earlier mm. on average than um, different years. So it definitely varies year to year, but we had in 2015, there was no snowpack at all mm. in the Cascades. And that year was crazy. I mean, it was, it was spring in February pretty much at 5,000 feet. So it was pretty, it's pretty wacky. Hmm. Yeah. I was, I've been seeing some bulbs coming up around here. Yeah. You know, it's mid January and it seems just a couple of years ago, it was mid February and it was like, I can't believe bulbs are coming up in mid February and here we are. And it, it's crazy. Yeah. It, this was a warm, we definitely had a warm January. Mm-hmm. It's cold now though. Yeah. I have a feeling we're, we're in for some, some weather Yeah, pretty soon. Well, it just that kind of the the thing that makes me think of the the research you did and the phenology and whatnot and how that impacts the birds is just kind of the the urban environment impacting the trees and the wildlife in the trees that are in the cities. And we think of, you know, the woods as being just this natural area that is kind of impermeable to to change or, you know, it's just this natural wildland it's too big to change yeah <laughs> but but you know Not the woods all. are changing just like the cities are and yeah. and the people are impacting the uh the urban forest by building and construction and the arborists are removing trees or making wildlife habitat and doing things to kind of affect it but the the forests are also changing yeah. you know there's a lot of succession happening in the forests and um and so the wildlife is impacted um, significantly by that, and I, I just kind of saw saw some correlation there between yeah. how the cities are being uh, really impacted, but the forests are too. Well, the cool thing about the cities though is they're more resilient because you can plant whatever you want. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I mean, to, got, to, to, to a degree, true. like we have East Coast trees water all it. over yeah. the place. Yeah. <laughs> trees, you know, we got Don Redwoods and Ginkgos. Like those are not yeah. native yeah. trees. So and. Now we've got sequoias, you know, that are going to be much more resilient to climate. So, so we're breeding this much more diverse, you know, selection of plants in in the cities because they survive because we water them and well, and you can just plant another one. I mean, that's that's different yeah. than in the woods. You can't replant the forest, but you can replant an urban forest. You know, it's gonna uh, it's, there's a there's a lot of planting happening more feasibility in the forest. to just one all than the other. monoculture. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. There's not enough trees now. The fire. Oh yeah, we have oh, yeah. trees to plant. <laughs> we have to grow some more. How has that affected, you know, habitat? It's pretty crazy. Um, we were out there today trying to figure out how the spotted owls are going to respond, because there's there's evidence that shows that what normally wouldn't be habitat the spotted owls will use because there's nothing left. I mean, they're going to use what's available. It's kind of an unknown, you know. Western Oregon hasn't seen fires like this since we've been recording fires. So there's evidence, you know, in the woods. There's certainly been standard blazing fires of this size, mm -hmm. just not when people have been around to suppress them. It's kind of remarkable how adaptable these species can be. Yeah. Just already you're seeing that. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's a fire-adapted ecosystem. Yeah. So it's not that... We don't have fire. We've just been very good at keeping fire off the ecosystem yeah. so that, you know, we we're these. not used to this. But mm -hmm. it's not necessarily out of the ordinary. It's just on a thousand-year scale, not right. a 50-year scale. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, I think, the, I think the wildlife will recover. And the fact is that the Cascades have, like, it's a super small percentage of the original early seral habitat so like mm -hmm. openings you know we we planted it all and we grew timber and dug first really good at growing where it didn't grow before so right like it it's not necessarily the end of the world it looks scary and it looks bad but you know these 
the Doug fir is great at growing. We're we're gonna have a forest in no time, and it's actually probably a good thing to have openings on the landscape and get some meadows back where they've been grown in and like for the wildlife. Oh, for sure. And deer and elk, I mean, they're going to be stoked. Uh, yeah. And the there's plenty of woods left. You know, we're not mm-hmm. we're not short on forests. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, 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 and really with the, the holiday farm fire, it really just kind of burned down the corridor where people lived. So you can just see, as far it as looks... I can see from the highway, but there is a ton of healthy forest that's still yeah, in the western Yeah, there's some Cascades beautiful here. mix of verity fires where mm-hmm. it just skunked along underground, and the crowns are great. There's just this yes. terrible right down the river corridor where the highway is, where everybody sees uh, it was crown yeah. fire. Mm-hmm. So we had, you know, 100% mortality. But outside that, it's it's there's some really nice fire. So. It's amazing how much it, because I've been up there a lot talking to locals, and how much it opened their eyes to wildlife. You know, how much they talk about the insects and the birds and the, you know, the wildlife that they didn't really think about before. But then now that everything burned and the people that are actually up there, they're like, oh, yeah, the crows came back, you know, and then First and then thing. we saw some, you know, and then we saw, you know, it, well, it opened their eyes to wildlife, yeah, which is really cool. It probably gave them a little bit of hope when it went from like this just total yeah. Devastation to all of a sudden there's life coming back into oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, big time. And and people will watch the regeneration and be like, oh wow, look at the maple sprouting. That's yeah. so cool. You know, Can and you they'll they'll see it in a new light. In like a decade, that whole corridor. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh man. Oh, yeah. I, I imagine every time I go up there. Yeah. <laughs> sure you do. Exactly. It's, it's only ten years away. It's only. 10 years away. <laughs> right now, though, the views are pretty amazing. I mean, you can yeah. see. I was up above the town of Blue River, and you can see all the way to Cougar Reservoir, unobstructed. Wow. Like wow. You can see the Mackenzie River. You can see the highway. You can, it's Whoa, crazy. I mean, really? Like, it's, That's amazing. It's shrunk the whole landscape. You can like, see like, like, where our house was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can still see the footprint of the foundation. <laughs> That's <laughs> all. Uh, everyone that I've talked to that's driven out there or been out there, they're just like, it's just chimneys. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. On well, that first month or so, but apparently now there are crows too. So that's yep. cool. Yeah. Crows the wildlife's back. coming back faster than the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I have a bunch of people that ask me about like furs that are dying. That's such a big thing. And then if you see any like drone footage of a forest, there's just so many furs that are checking out. Are you talking about in the valley? I'm just anywhere, yes, in the valley for sure. But it, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean, I would say that their dug firs don't naturally grow in the valley. Fair so enough. I mean, they were already at the extreme of their range, and now we've got enough climate change that they've been that range has contracted, and dug firs are there's yeah. I think they're stressed, and there's beetles, and they they're just outside their range at this point. So yeah, that, but that I do sense. think I mean they are getting shocked in the ch- in the forest too. Like it's not just the valley; like it's definitely the Cascades. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I've noticed hemlocks that are dying in the forest. I mean, I, there's there's places out in the forest that I've been revisiting for 15 years on a yearly basis, and I go and I climb there throughout the summer, and I'll be like, oh, that tree died. Yep. That tree died. Yep. A lot of hemlocks are dying, which yeah, is I'm kind of a surprise. Too. I think there's definitely a lot of stress. I yeah. mean, there, there's been water drought. Yeah, drought. Yeah. Stress <laughs> Dri- driving down I-5 to Grants Pass, you see it down yeah. there also a lot. Southern you know? Oregon, yeah, that's so even it's more It's just intense. getting nailed. Yeah. yeah, it's hot down there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's basically NorCal at this point. Yikes. Yeah. Well, and that kind of gets back to the difference between the city and the forest. Yeah. You know, uh, in the city... You can just plant a bunch of trees, and you you hire the person to go around and water them. And you know, in the forest, if it if it's not getting watered, you can put all the trees in the ground you want. But yeah. if they're not getting watered, it is yeah. what it is. Well, and our municipality, in particular, I think we're trying to make our approved street tree list a little bit more climate change friendly and like plan for the future as well. So there's you know now it's like you, you know Chinese pistache, you know. Virgin Ironwood, things like that. Yep. You know, they're they're going to be well suited for the forecoming perceived climate in the next. Is that what that uh? The Protea. Chitalpa. No, oh, the, the Chitalpa. The Chitalpa. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. That's another one that I think was uh, brought up here. We have those on our road. Yeah, they're on. Because they yeah. say you know in the next decade, um, you know where we are here now in Eugene will be like. 
how Sacramento right. is. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm thinking like a decade. Decade. Like, that's like, like, <laughs> what? like March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it feels. So, um, but yeah, it's interesting that you talk about that because like we we are able we do have that flex where right. we can like apply this you know this knowledge that we in and then make these changes and and plant these species and then take what we have had in the past and turn it you know respectively into um into wildlife habitat whereas it's a little bit more restricted it seems yeah well the woods do it on their own though so. it, that's true yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well and so there's the, less yeah. targets too yeah. exactly yeah. and yeah. they just do it on a different time scale than we exactly do. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. a decade so. to us is a long time decade to the woods is yeah Small a beans. tree yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like two minutes to a tree yeah. Yeah. so i'm not i'm by no means like a scientist but my understanding is that you know the climate is getting warmer the uh, dug firs are getting pushed out of their kind of limits of their uh, zones that they that they thrive in, and so it's stressing them. And then when they're stressed, they kind of attract bark beetles. The bark beetles come in and then disrupt the vascular system, and that is kind of what finishes a lot of them off. But the the dug firs that genetically just have more sap will detour the beetles more because the beetles don't like the sap. Uh. And so they have a little bit more resistance. And then I also, I was working up at Hendricks Park and they were putting uh, some kind of like attractant for the bark beetles. Like so a that, pheromone. Yeah, pheromone yeah. so that the beetles would go after that instead of the trees. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. It trying is- to like save the trees up at Hendricks Park. Does that seem to work, that pheromone? Yeah, um, that was actually one of my first college jobs was putting nice. out pheromones. But um, yeah, they just it's basically the the same attractant that females put out whatever the insect is, and they put it usually it's in a triangle. I don't know what this looked like, but usually it's like a triangle trap that's sticky, and it's just oh, like yeah, you yeah. use for mealworms. It's like in a your little house, tent, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah, it's just a yeah. little tent, and it's like there's the ladies, and then the males all go, and they can't, <laughs> and breathe. then they get stuck in the party tent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Party. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they all show up and he's like, Where's the ladies? Yeah. Come on. Oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong Just party. no good yeah. in here though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. I'll So play that's here. that's interesting though. They that like the it's not necessarily just the drought that's killing the trees. A lot of it is the bark beetle. Well, and they bring in fungi too. I mean, like yeah. oh, that's the, why they, Cryptoporus shows up so quickly after trees die is that it comes in on the back of the beetle mm-hmm. it doesn't kill the the tree but once the tree's dead the cryptopore is like yeah but uh, it's already there, it's the already there. Are there yeah so like when you look in a cryptopore is like blob you know the, the little fungi looks um, like a little marshmallow kind of yeah it's a yep. little marshmallow yep. but Cute. if you, there's a little <laughs> flap on the underside and that's where all the spores are they're under it's crypto so hidden pores mm-hmm. um and that's where all the spores are and the beetles go in there and they get all the spores and they munch away on the sporophyte then bring them into the trees and they have they carry okay. other fungi too you know it's not necessarily yeah. just and, w- and one thing that i've always heard when talking about trees and tree mortality is it's not really ever just one thing that kills yeah. a tree i mean there's there's certain things that will just like with port orford cedar you have um what's the fungus that kills phytophthora phytophthora yeah. thank yeah. you yeah. phytophthora that will definitely kill a port orford cedar there's just so many factors you have the drought you have the the bark beetle you have xyz mm-hmm. and they're all just sitting there hammering this tree yeah. and then it dies I totally was it, it doesn't it does. say that but not as smartly well <laughs> <laughs> you probably would have said it in a pun though so <laughs> <laughs> it's not just one thing that kills the tree <laughs> that's a lot of things <laughs> many 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 <laughs> including me yeah no it's it's true though and that that's one of the things they teach you you know when you're when you start reading more and like isa is very you know plant health care things like that it's always it's not just 
one thing when you're doing diagnosis. It's like a, a yeah. series of unfortunate events. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain that to a client sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. They want like they want a definitive answer to why is this yeah. tree dead? And you're like, well, really, yeah. there's a lot to look like, at well, here. You, <laughs> <over> <laughs> here. <laughs> you made all these stuff. Look, I want this tree to be like a <laughs> <laughs> I want this tree to be like a person. You know, cancer kills a person. What is a cancer in this tree? Yeah. Like, yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's not quite... Yeah, it's not so black and white. So yeah. there, there's definitely a lot to it. That's for sure. Yeah. Another thing too that like this all is reminding me of is that when we, especially in urban forestry, when we consider a tree to be dead, I'm using air quotes for those of you who can't see. But when we say dead, it's not necessarily dead. Like there's so much stuff going on. The roots are still active. And even even when that stops happening, there's like there's all these you know fungi, bugs, stuff is still happening in that tree for a very long time. Even I mean there there are stumps that are thousands of you know years old that I've seen in uh, documentaries. I hope I'm correct. Oh in yeah. Saying yeah. That. <laughs> no, there's, that, there's and they're you know because they're they they have their friends there next to them in the for forest. Sure. For, in particular, you know, in a, in a forest setting, like they can live for a long time. So, you know, when we, it, again, like especially in urban forestry, we'll see something and it has significant dieback and we're like, that tree is dying. It is dead. There are no live buds on it. There are no leaves on it. It looks dead. It's punky. It's got to go. But there's still a lot of life happening. In there, it. There's a very debatable question of is a tree more alive when it's growing than when it's a nurse log on the ground, or is it exactly. more alive as a nurse log on the ground than it was when it was growing? Exactly. I mean, that's a very debatable question, and mm-hmm. we, we've uh, discussed that a lot. Yeah, just think about the genetic potential of a nurse log versus a single species or it's, a single individual. Well, and just the biomass with yeah. the bugs. Yeah. 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 H.J. Andrews has yeah, some really cool experiments that are slated hundreds of years, like 300 years in the future, um, that's researching like the decomposition of, of trees that are, you know, old growth trees on the ground, hundreds of years for mm-hmm. generations and generations to come. They're going to be monitoring and researching these logs. It's really cool place. Our, our great, great grandchildren won't have the answers that they're going for. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're like 40 years in at this point. Wow. 50. Wow. Maybe. 50 well, years. Well, the Anders was founded in 48. Yeah. yeah so and it was shortly after that, I think they started it. Yeah. So in the relaxed. lifetime of a tree, Mark would know. Yeah, that's like a minute. <laughs> yeah, or thirty seconds. Yeah, especially an old growth, you know, yeah. Doug Ferry. Well, shout out to Mark Schultz. He's the man. He's the the forest. He's the director. Uh, director the up at the H J Andrews. He's wow, a really cool guy. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard a lot about that. He introduced me and Rob. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that really kind of brings a full circle to why we wildlife these trees because we're trying to take that in a safe way so you can do it in someone's backyard. You're trying to take that living tree that's checking out or you need to remove for some reason and turn it into that nurse log, that standing nurse log that's going to take care of so many different creatures. And and those, those insects and those bugs need help right now. Well, it's it's like the homeowner's experiment. Yeah. They're like, is it yeah. is a bird gonna move in? <laughs> what's gonna happen? It, yeah, it, what, it, what's it, gonna happen if I leave this log? Is it gonna <laughs> fall on my fence? <laughs> <laughs> but it really oh. is. Yeah. When you talk to the clients, oh, you yeah. know, and you, you go back to the place, a lot of times they're checking in like, Oh, I saw some birds in the bird hole or yeah. you know, oh you know, I've had Albie send me pictures from snags I did oh, years yeah. ago and like, Oh dude, look at the mushrooms that are growing on it and you know Oh, just See, I was, this week I was talking to the client about leaving this massive uh, ponderosa pine log on the ground. Cool. You know, yeah. and, and just let it, it's just in the forest. You know, they they were like, oh, I don't know. It's not that good of firewood. It's just let it stay there. You know, there's no reason. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I ever saw a habitat tree that, you know, consciously saw a habitat tree was one when I was working in the private industry and my boss had done it probably five or ten years previ- prior to that. And I saw, it, you know, just dead standing, I think it was a fur, just a dead standing fur there, uh, probably 40 feet tall or something like that. And I was like, why? I, I was I was a much younger arborist. I didn't really understand <laughs> that. Too. I'm like, why would you leave a dead standing? Like, that's a hazard. Just get rid of it. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't quite there yet. But 
Nice, but you remember. I remember it, yeah, because <laughs> that sticks to my memory. I'm like, why, why, that just doesn't make sense. And now that I've kind of evolved as an arborist, I'm like, yes, that do- does make sense. We do need these habitat trees. They're vital. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, it reminds me of talking about the log on the ground. If you go on up friendly, you know, on 18th there and you head up the hill, on the right, halfway up that hill, there's a spot where me and Yaniv removed a black oak, you know, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. But we, we dropped the, you know, as a leaf chunk in a random size. So we dropped this uh, log and it wasn't anything huge, but it's black oak. So it's pretty heavy, you know? Yeah. And the, uh, the client's like, All right, well, what should I do with it? You know, do you, you want the firewood? You can have it. And I was like, Oh no, we got plenty of firewood, you know, contract leave all. And I was like, you can just leave it here and it, you know, it'll rot into the ground and it'll feed, you know, nutrients will go into the ground. Tons of bugs will live in it. It'll be a bonus for the, you know, for the environment. And to this day, you know, we've been working up there and every time I drive up, I see this log on the side of the road. It's still there. And it's just, you know, it's rotten and old chunk. It's like, yep, there we go. You know, it's so great to drive past a project that you worked on, especially when it ages in the way that you, it's exciting to see it age. Like, it, 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 you know, if you plant a tree and then you drive past the tree that you planted, it's like, oh, wow, it's growing. That's so exciting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. Yeah. But if you drive past something that you leave as, like, a habitat snag and then you get to see it, like, over time, like, the, the, the fresh cut will look more natural over time and you'll get, you'll see these little mushrooms and you'll see birds on it. It's like, oh. Yeah, it's it'd be cool to circle. revisit it in like fifty years, though. Yeah, if, if that yeah. log is still there and and just kind of check it out, you know, yeah, be like, what, what is so growing on this <laughs> thing? Yeah. You know, yeah. what has it become? Yeah, <laughs> and you might be surprised too, like things that you like with Corey's story with those birds. <laughs> you yeah. might expect yeah. one one thing to move in and something totally different happens. <laughs> Fucking starlings. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty. Maybe not so detrimental, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. that's just a matter of opinion, Corey. <laughs> so are we. No. <laughs> I, w- I just want to know what starling hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have a lot of hurt, Becca, and I don't I think a podcast is a place to dive into that. Right Fair enough. Uh. All right. So this week for the uh, Tree Thinking Gear Review, we're going to go into uh, the gear that we use to make wildlife snags. So uh, there's a couple different ways we can go. Uh, Dan was talking about using big saws. Um, I know, I think it was Brian French that got an electric saw and was using a little electric saw. Definitely. You know, for some of that stuff. So yeah, I've seen I've seen him use electric saws on uh, creating those birdhouses. Which, which, you know, I mean, that sounds like an awesome way to do it. But uh, where where would you like to start, Rob? You were talking about the 500 die a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, the 500 die is like the new big badass or kind of medium-sized but just as strong as the big badass saw out on the market. And it is amazing. Don't get me wrong. I love the saw. They're, it's second to none in terms of powder weight ratio. But I have found that the tip kind of kick back or kind of like pushing out of a cut when when the the chain gets a little bit pinched because it's so powerful, will really kick back. I think that using a big saw on a, a wildlife pole, there's a time and a place for it. Like ripping down the, you know, when you're when you're cutting across the grain and you, you need to get some big chunks out, it makes sense. But if you're trying to, like, dive in and do a plunge cut, I would be careful if you're using a, a saw that's got some serious power-to-weight ratio uh, because, you know, the, the kickback. And I, I remember going to Brian French's seminar and kind of looking at what he was doing and being like, holy smokes, this guy's wielding a, a pretty serious saw, like, in a confined close quarters situation. So I, I think that it's really important to uh, take into consideration the tip of your bar, you know, don't be messing with any kickback, you know, when you're when you're doing wildlife uh, snags. Yeah, and and when you're creating those wildlife snags, you're typically in a pretty compromised position. You're n- you're not yeah. you know firmly rooted on the ground. You know, two points of contact. Definitively, you're 
like yeah. on the top of a possible spar pole or you, you might be out on a branch and you're you're trying to finagle this giant ass saw while getting its tip in there and trying to dig out these pieces. Yeah. It's definitely every cut you make, you have to be double, triple check, be like, okay, is that going to come back at me? Do I have enough control over this? Is this going to end poorly for me or can we get through this kind of thing? Just make sure you know what you're getting into mm-hmm. and, and you know what you're doing while you're using the saws. <laughs> right. And if you're using something that's really uh, juiced up like a 500 eye and you're doing some kind of plunge cut and you're on your lanyard and spurs, be be careful and know what you're doing. Yeah. Is the 500 eye an electric? No. No, it's no. a it's a big gas saw. Okay, yeah, it's, it's one of those bigger ones. Fuel yeah. injected, okay. like the most power to weight ratio of any saw right Two now, I think. Stroke city. Yeah. What, yeah. One of the things I've realized that's always made me nervous when I was doing habitat is it's a it's different than you know, if, I don't care how many trees you've chunked down, you're cutting at a different angle because you're cutting down into it, which means you're cutting towards your lanyard and your safety tie in points. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but the kickback is different. When you're cutting down, it's going to kick back like this, which, like you were saying, you're kind of in a compromised position. You know, everything is really close. So you might not be able to fully extend your arm and brace yourself for that kickback. You might be cutting at a bit of an awkward angle. It's yeah. a confined space. Yeah, so yeah. understand when you're cutting down, you're cutting towards your lifeline. So you better know exactly where your lanyard and your uh, ropes are, and you better know exactly where that bar is because – it, does, it happens quick if you're going to cut a line. And it might be different. You might have been climbing trees for 20 years, but not making wildlife poles. Right. Yep. And when you start making wildlife poles, you're doing different things with the chainsaw than you're used to. So just keep that in mind. Especially yeah. when you're, like, getting into the artistic part of yeah. it. You're like, oh, yeah. I'm going to Picasso this. Like, I'm going to, like, put a Zorro mark in here. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it's then. true. I've caught myself thinking about my next four yeah. cuts. You know, I'm going to cut this and then I'm going to bring this. Maybe I'm going to take this stub and Meanwhile, try to turn this stub into it. And I'm not focusing on your yeah, tie-in. Where I, or the tie-in. Yeah. And I'm rotating back and forth. Yeah. So the lanyard's shifting as I'm rotating. So if you're not, every time you move, you want to make sure you know where that lanyard is. Yeah. You know. That, Definitely. So we're, sorry, backtrack. Skirt, beep, beep. Yeah. Uh, were we talking about electric saws for making? Yeah, we uh, uh, we we had mentioned it. We had mentioned that um, uh, Brian he uses uh, electric saws to do a okay. lot of his work, just because that's what he does. But we're we're talking about um, the five hundred. I just came in with right. uh, Dan Krause on the larger saws. Are there larger electric saws on the market? I'm not familiar if there are. Um, not, that would not, be so cool if not, there were. Not super. But the batteries. So yeah. f- so far, the batteries just quite aren't quite there. Yeah, um, got to talk to Elon. Yeah, Elon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna write a giant, strongly giant, worded email. Just, just drive a Tesla up to the tree. Get us to Mars, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. gonna make drone arborists. <laughs> how how many ten foot jumper cab- cables are we gonna have to hook together yeah, to get <laughs> from the well, Tesla well, to the top <laughs> of the tree? <laughs> if you're doing a ten foot or twenty foot spar, you only need a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that's I true, ask, and that's where though, the big one is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm I'm only asking because um, the obvious benefits of using an electric saw as opposed to a two-stroke uh, or gas-powered anything like that would be it's a lot more quiet. Um, yeah. So especially uh, like if you're out in the forest, or I mean even in the urban forest, it's like <laughs> I think we can all agree that really loud drawing noises are like <laughs> not the most desirable thing. But especially in terms of wildlife, if you're trying to invite more critters it's probably better to use something a little bit more quiet i'm i'm um, a huge advocate for electric saws yeah. and we've been running them for years honestly <laughs> the the main thing that got us into electric saws is the fire, uh, fire season mm-hmm. you know because yeah. you can't you can't use combustible motors mm-hmm. uh during fire season and probably five years ago or something four years ago we we got our first couple husky like first generation electric saws and nice um they're great they're they're awesome saws i i'm totally on board and i think that the uh, trajectory of the industry is going to be moving toward electric it's the future it's the future yeah. it, and it, it's the just future. like cars yeah, <laughs> right. like, yeah it's it's nice to have like longer. the big badass saw you know that's got a lot of power but things are going to change to where yeah. the electric saws probably have more power <laughs> than the Gas traditionally had, and it's. I can't wait. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, but those electric saws, they just don't scream "fuck you, environment." Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're 
you're not scaring the birds with your loud noises. You're not pumping out all this carbon. Who are you? Know? you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the bronze villain him is really coming out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, that, that's very true. Corey, Corey has a point. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to the, the old technology. It's not yeah. doing it for my ego. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's got to go. Uh, uh, what is that? Fragile masculinity? Or there, yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah. That's, you got it. Good I got job. it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. You know, there's something is to the fact that, you know, to kind of shift the, the angle of what we're looking at it for wildlife with electric saws, you know, there's times a year where some animals are really sensitive to nesting, and I could see running power saw, you know, gas saws, Real loud gas saws could spook birds out of nests, mm -hmm. could cause all kinds of problems. Oh, so, for sure. you know, I mean, well, and this gosh, is something I, mean, I don't know. It a we, lot, a lot of birds are actually protect or were. I don't know if they still are or not because of the all the changes that Trump made. But birds are protected. You can't you can't climb trees while certain species are nesting. It's well, illegal. Yeah, you should. Yeah, but <laughs> you should. But, <laughs> but no, one, illegal. You, but we you don't know if the birds in the tree. Right. There's been lots of times I've cl started climbing trees and been like, oh, there's a bird. You know, it's that time, it, you know, they're nesting and then you leave. But yeah. it's very possible that you could be out there making cuts and not know, and it, not yeah. know that yeah. they're yeah. there. So or you can be in an adjacent tree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, at, at the Forest Service, we implement seasonal restrictions. So, you know. that It's like rock climbing. Yeah, exactly. Like peregrines. You can't, yeah. you shouldn't be climbing in, you know, exposed cliffs during peregrine nesting season, which is usually like March to July. But people aren't really great at following those but yeah, yeah i mean yeah. we you know for spotted owls and for harlequin ducks and bald eagles there's if there's a known nest then you buffer this you know up to 300 meters yeah. where you can't you can't operate a saw you know adjacent to that nest yeah for, it's usually for bald eagles it's like january to july it's a really long <laughs> season wow. but yeah yeah not to mention too like the fire component of it yeah which, now that you yeah you, know, you all mentioned that it's like well I mean, even in town here, it was when we had those fires in September, it was, you know, 2 p.m., no more of that. Yeah, so the yeah, noise, so. pollution, yeah. fire, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. curious if, since battery saws are a relatively new technology, and, we, you know, we have we have gasoline-powered chainsaws, they're, you know, an old proven kind of thing. I'm wondering if fire restrictions will change around batteries, because I know that com batteries can be fairly combustible given yeah. the right conditions. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if there's going to be, as we kind of dial that back for the battery saws and people kind of look at it like, okay, we can just go out there with battery saws because those are better than gas chainsaws. But then I'm wondering if we're going to see some, some more incidents around that just with the batteries. I bet it would take an incident to create a regulation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, would, yeah. <laughs> it, it would have to be a pretty big incident, but I'm well, wondering. And even incident. then, like, I wonder what the... Like statistically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be more. I mean, you can have a, a fire with a hubcap. Or, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. feel like <laughs> I feel like it. It's unlikely that some like, like a arbor an an arborist working in the city in an urban environment has. I, I think it's very unlikely that they've started a fire that turned yeah. into a big mess. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's more of just a like broad span ban on combustible motors because of lawnmowers and because of exhaust on trucks and because of just motors in general yeah, yeah. that have started fires. But and I think that, us. like, an arborist operating in a residential neighborhood starting a fire Not that, like, like I, it's yeah. very yeah. unlikely. Right. I, I'm, I'm focusing more on, like, working in the woods, like yeah. Tim oh, yeah. or something yeah. like that. If somebody, somebody, totally somebody uh, like chunking down a fur in a backyard is not going to start a yeah a holiday sure. farm fire kind of thing. Yeah, no. but I mean, they also often, unless it's really extreme fire conditions, there's often exemptions. Mm -hmm. um, oh well, yeah, you can so go down to ODF. You can get out of the fire. Project. You can go down to ODF, and we get uh, we get permits every year, mm -hmm. yeah, so that we can operate. Like usually, they shut it down completely, but then we can operate. I think outside of ten to one. Yeah, which yeah. is like the worst season. So like 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. we're shut yeah. down. But other than that, we can use or saws. Or if you have a water tender. Or if you have someone that's observe how, the job site for away. two hours gotcha. afterwards. Gotcha. Sometimes yeah. you have to observe it. That's probably a logging thing. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. But you have to observe the job site and just have someone on site for two hours after you use the equipment. So there's 
there's yeah. permits and things that you can do to kind of get around Unless the it's regulations. Crazy, you know, like it's hot and dry yeah, and then they just August, shut it down. Then they just no use. Right. But yeah. Yeah. there's too much timber in this in, in this area to fully shut down anybody. You just yeah. work yeah. around it with water. Yeah. Yep. Which is also running low, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Mark your pumps yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, man. Does anybody else have any gear review stuff around wildlife and? Oh yeah, definitely. Or fire. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have fire extinguishers, <laughs> and, and yellow buckets full of water, and things like that when you're operating. I mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, yeah. I've had saws catch fire on me before. Yeah, like little oh, climbers saws just. I've had some smoke up to the point where, and they, and I could feel how hot they were. I'm like, oh no. Have you guys ever had them geyser? Uh-uh. Is that a, so? In the Forest Service, it's it's like a big thing, safety wise, because there will be guys in the fire and they'll be operating their saws all day, mm-hmm. and then the, there's a couple saws. I don't know. Sometimes they'll have some failure point where, it, where they open to fill it with gas. And it geysers out all well, the gas. Yeah, because it's in, in the it. middle of the summer and, and it's hot. It, and it's yeah. expanding the fire. heat. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. it's and hot. The chamber. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So that's like, in, and they'll get coated yeah. with gas and they'll catch on fire. Oh, yeah. Wait, definitely. The saw or the, the gas can? Like when you open no, the like, saw. Oh, okay. well, the, the saw, the saw will too, if, if it's not empty. Yeah. If yeah. it's like three quarters of the way empty and that they all go sense. back to to yep. reload. And you their just uh, while well, I'm here I'll gas just, up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's sense. hot as can yes. be out. Yep. Yeah. And you've been running the saw all day, so the saw's uh, burning. Right yeah. Yeah. So like on Guy, geysers out, hits the muffler or whatever and then Yeah. Well oh, and so like if you're on a fire, like in an active mm-hmm. fire zone, then the, you're supposed to go into the black right. where it's already burned over, it's not hot anymore, then you gas your saw. Because that way if it geysers, you don't catch on fire. That's wow, like the uh, more you know. I know, right? They <laughs> <laughs> always send these like scary what emails, and you're like, "Oh so my god!" Like, <laughs> Here's a video of a man catching on fire. Yeah, yeah. my Don't sock and Kaiser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This wasn't in the manual. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Steel. Just put yeah. this in there. Yeah. Well, on that note, final thoughts. I look forward to making my next wildlife pull. Yeah, yeah. and I. I uh, look forward to making my first kind of like, what, what do you call that when you dive in? Uh, uh, the bird cut. box. Okay, the boring cut yeah. uh, nest boring for cut a bird. bird box. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I want to, and, I, and in a perfect so case scenario, <laughs> in, a, in the best uh, position, I would know what kind of bird I was making it for and what size of hole to put in the front uh-huh. so that the damn starlings don't go in there. Fucking <laughs> 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 starlings. <laughs> Take out the bird. I mean, if you, if you want robins in. or if you want anything that's bigger than Starlings a starling, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll do some research. You could start yeah. small, go for a hairy woodpecker, and then that'll slowly build up to the next species because it'll uh, make the whole bigger. They will pass it on. So we got to yeah. see where the hairy woodpeckers are, get some pheromones. And <laughs> 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 Too much work. Too yeah. much work. Yeah. Uh, every, time, every time I do a habitat tree, I feel like I learn just one little thing more and it's it's i'm definitely not a proficient habitat uh tree maker yet i've done a lot of them but i just i'm not proficient and i won't i won't profess to be proficient at all but every time i do one i get a little bit better and i feel like that's i mean that's kind of arboriculture in a nutshell every time you do something you just get a little bit better at it and by the end of my career maybe i'll be a great uh habitat person so that's kind of what i'm striving for and maybe i'll get there oh you will um, I, day after tomorrow, I have a job where we're taking down a couple of big firs and, um, I've been tasked with making my very first habitat tree. I'm oh, very wow. much looking forward to it. And I think this has been a good talk, probably going to do a little bit of research and nice. the takeaways have been good, but I'm excited cause I've, I've worked the ground for a lot of these projects and, uh, have soaked up as much as I can, but. To actually do it, it's just like you were just saying, Corey, is like it, the more you do something, and even if you do it for the first time, it's a totally different ball game. And um, yeah, I'm excited about it. So this has been great. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. I love birds and bugs and trees and He's the a full nature circle. Neat. It's so good. <laughs> 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 I can't yeah. get enough of that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Going to the woods next week and playing in the snow, and I'll be looking at the wildlife trees. Nice. Give you guys some ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Some snags. 
So put it on the gram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need a better camera. <laughs> you can't really get to the top of an old girl. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yep. Nice. Well, I kind of like what you said about how every one you do, you get a little bit better. Because I've felt that way as I've done wildlife snags over the years. You learn a little trick every time. And I think one of the big tricks that I learned was to just try to, instead of try to make it look what I think it should look like, look at what, you know, I just, I've, I've Googled pictures of like, you know, rip out and just looked at pictures of rip outs and then just like, how can I do that? You know, so just trying to recreate nature is a, a great way to do it. One of my big takeaways from this conversation has been uh, listening to Sarah talk about how the bugs and the, you know, the, the flowers bloom at a certain time, which takes the bugs and it needs to line up with when the birds get there. And it really connected some of the dots of how creating a wildlife in the city is, is really part of that circle. You know, you're, you're trying to bring that aspect, which is one of the aspects that I think a lot of times we're trying to remove from a city is, you know, those dead branches and the things we don't think look nice, but really that's one of the really important parts of, the forest and so the wildlife trees are actually bringing that into the city and kind of creating a safe uh, uh, space for that so uh, I think that's that's one of the big takeaways that nice that I'm taking out of this and on that I think uh, we're gonna wrap it up so everybody stay safe and watch your top knot go wildlife <laughs>